So we're going to talk about the indolocation service for NG911 using Bluetooth low energy. So the NG911 BT is a project that uses, blue, that uses uh, Bluetooth beacons to provide information such as the address, the floor, and the closest room to, of the person making a 911 call. So the project is a proof of concept and it aims at using um, a number of components to reach the emergency call taker. The components include the Bluetooth information, basically Bluetooth information, the mobile phone application, the location database, and the IP-based NG911 network. So during an emergency situation, both information and response time are very critical. The first responders need to spend the least amount of time trying to locate the person who made the 911 call, and the location information will help be able to cut down on this amount of time. And by improving the location, we'll be able to help save at least 10,000 lives annually. So today, the 911 emergency service only provides horizontal location um, of a person. That is basically the physical address. And it uses circuit switch networks. And what we're trying to do is move to the IP-based network. So the FCC mandated that cellular providers should uh, meet a number of requirements. One is that they should, in addition to having horizontal location, they should also be able to provide vertical location to the PSAP. And the vertical location is basically room level identification. Secondly, they need to use information from Wi-Fi access points and also Bluetooth beacons to be able to calculate information, uh, I mean location information. And they should also be a 30 second maximum time period between the time the call is sent and the time that the PSAP operator answers the call. And also, in the next five years, they propose to achieve about 80% reliability and an accuracy that's below 50 meters for 911 emergency services. So I will now hand over to Alberto, who will talk about the solution. Thank you, Nathania. Well, um, we built a solution that uses two main technologies, Bluetooth, low energy, um, you use this technology because it's available in all the current new smartphones. And it's also uh, very efficient. Uh, the, the power consumption is very low in Bluetooth. And we use it to identify uh, our devices. Uh, we will use devices that use Bluetooth called iBeacons. These devices will be sending an identification that we will help us to to estimate the location of the call, and then we use another technology, the uh, protocol, which is the session initiation protocol, and we use it because it's uh, it allows us to send multimedia over IP networks, and it's actually the the Nina uh, protocol that well the the protocol that Nina. Uh, requires us to use. So we have four main modules. Uh, the first module is the one top corner at the left, which is the uh, iBeacon module. This can be one device or an array of devices that would be deployed in in a specific location where we want to provide indoor location. Then we will have the caller, which who will have uh, the the smartphone and will. Once he called 911, we'll be scanning all the information from all the iBeacons within his re region. And then this information will be uh, sent as HTTP through to the or location server, which is this third model at the right top corner. And we will first parse uh, the data we get from the cell phone and then use an algorithm that will estimate the location for of the user, we use a database where we will have the information of each iBeacon device, and 
and the algorithm which will estimate based on the power, the received power, uh, what's the estimated location of the user, and will be sent back as an XML PDF flow uh, to the to the smartphone. Then finally, the smartphone will generate a SIP invite uh, to the four module or emergency services IP network in IIT, uh, where the SIP will be received, in, and finally the call dispatcher will be able to see uh, the outdoor location and all the, also the indoor location of the caller. So uh, the, the Bluetooth module uh, has two main components, with, which are the, the particle photon, and the, which is the, the, the microcontroller, and it includes a Wi-Fi antenna, and we will have also the Bluetooth model uh, integrated to this device. And it has been designed by one another of our members that is here today, and he will be talking more in deep about uh, this device and our platform called Pilot tomorrow. And the, the way it works is the, the device, the Bluetooth devices, the iBeacons, will be sending advertising, they will be in advertising mode. So they will only be sending information to the environment. And then the cell phone will collect this information. There won't be any kind of communication between cell phone and an iBeacon. The cell phone is only listening what's happening in the environment. Then uh, the flow of the process within the cell phone, uh, the application works as follows. Uh, the user can both call 911 or use uh, a UI application and click 911 call. Then it will start all the application flow, which is first turn on automatically the Bluetooth, and then start collecting data from all the IV icons. Once it's collected, send this information to the server, and if the server recognizes this information, will uh, estimate the location of the user and send it back as XML has said before and uh, embed, uh, attach this information inside the, the SIP invite and send it to the to the PISA. For the for this uh, for this uh, for testing this solution uh, we have been using uh, this, the following plan that will be explained by Carol Davis, and she will also explain some of the algorithms we used, and so on. So, yeah. So. Uh, the, uh, what we did is we were able to manufacture a hundred of these eye beacons that were designed by, and I just would like Barat to wave so everybody would see who it is. If you're able to be here on Thursday morning, we're going to have a panel discussion in which he describes the design of those eye beacons, and then we describe uh, also the database, and Dee will be explaining that. So, and some of the algorithms. So we'll have a, a larger time to discuss that. So what we did, however, was manufactured 100 of these devices according to Barat's design. And uh, we were helped by that with the support of T-Mobile, which actually gave us some funding to do the manufacture. We installed them in one building of the IIT main campus. That's the Stewart Building, for those who are familiar with it. They're small devices about that big, and they're fairly unobtrusively positioned on, towards the ceilings of th a three-story building. The big problem that we anticipated was that it would be difficult to differentiate between floors. And uh, so, so that was the first part of the algorithm. We had to figure out how to say which floor these beacons were on. But what we did is uh, then we made, uh, we placed the devices, we made test calls at predetermined locations, basically two inputs to an experiment or a set, a set of tests. And that would be where we positioned the iBeacons and then where we positioned the test people. 
who is going to be taking tests. And we defined success according to if you wanted to, to be accurate within, say, 10 meters, uh, then a success would be if all of your tests were, you know, were accurate within 10 meters. So if you could identify within a 10 meter perimeter. <clears throat> what we then did was uh, we could vary to two variables. One would be the, the, the density or the placement of the eye beacons in the building, and the other would be the placement of the testers. But we've made, basically kept the tester positions constant and changed the density of the eye beacons. So we've got a, a large, we're building a large uh, data set to be uh, a, se a set of data consisting of where did we position the eye beacons, and then where did we position the testers? How do I forward this? Now, here. Where? Thank you. Okay. Is that it? Okay. We have, uh, the building is 81 by 46 by 10 meters, three floors, 20 devices per floor, and our first experiment, uh, we, we did the maximum. We did the 20 devices per floor. We placed them in room entrances, stairwells, and hallways. And for the second experiment, we just subtracted half of them. So uh, I can give you experimental data for those. So experiment one, call testing was done at room entrances, between rooms, inside rooms, and stairwells. 10 seconds worth of Bluetooth data were collected and those were then passed to the location server, and the location server then applied, we applied initially three separate algorithms to determine uh, the closest Bluetooth beacon. So bear in mind, we're not telling you the XY coordinates or the XYZ coordinates of the caller. We're telling you the XYZ coordinates of the closest eye beacon, okay? But f we then know where that is, and for the purposes of next generation 911, uh, when we're getting within 10 meters, they can see you normally and know where you are. So for the purposes and certainly for the requirements set that we were given, we're, we're reaching a high level of accuracy. <clears throat> uh, these slides will be available. I don't think I need to, to show you the, the floor plan, but they will be available for you. The three simple algorithms that were used were the max, they're all based upon the power, the received signal uh, uh, strength that we, that we get as a iPhone. So the simplest was, uh, well, first we had to determine the floor. We did that by a simple vote. In other words, the phone is collecting a set of information. The identification of the first uh, Bluetooth beacon that it sees together with the RSSI, the signal strength. So he says to set, these are the four uh, ID num IDs and the power associated with them. He sends that set of data to the location server. The location server applies one of these three algorithms, chooses, uh, and, and then sends his location back. But the first part of that algorithm is what floor is he on? So suppose I've gotten five, uh, five eye beacons that are responding to me, and I uh, see Three of them are on the fourth, on the third floor, and two of, and uh, one of them is on uh, on the, a different floor. I'm going to take the majority rules, and we found that to be a highly successful algorithm because we we figured that while if I'm speaking to you and I if I'm uh, making the call and there's one eye beacon above me on the floor above me, there's probably going to be three that see me on this floor and only one that's going to see me above. So we decided the simple vote, and that has proved to be almost 100% successful, I think, in our, when we, we diluted the number of, of uh, beacons that are responding. I think we did get a failure there. So what we're doing now is testing how well these algorithms work. Once we decide what floor you're on by the simple vote, then we apply the three algorithms. The simplest one was just the max signal strength. You simply look at all the RSSI values, you pick the Bluetooth beacon which has got the highest received signal strength, you say he's the one who's closest, and, uh, and that would be the max, that would be the simplest algorithm. The average, we said for each Bluetooth device, take an average of the RSSIs and pick the highest one. 
for all of them. And the log average would be for each Bluetooth device, take the log of the geometric mean of the RSSIs and pick the highest. So interestingly, when we had the maximum uh, uh, deployment density, the simplest was the best. Uh, I'll give you some of those. So in experiment one, when we had 20 per floor, 80% success at 10 meters for all three algorithms. 100% success at 17 meters for all three algorithms. In experiment two, when we have the density, 80% success at 10 meters for all three, 100% at 19 meters uh, for, for uh, the average and the log average, and 100% at 21 meters for the maximum, uh, the maximum signal. So uh, we're in the midst of collecting more and more and more data, and uh, so we'll, we'll be able to publish some of these first results soon. Uh, but that's the direction in which we're going. And we invite anybody's comments and feedback on that. We're still, uh, we're still studying our algorithms. And our next step is to actually, we've now got uh, maps of the, uh, we now have maps that are to scale and we're, uh, we're going to start with XY coordinates that actually identify the XY coordinate of the, uh, of the caller as opposed to the XY coordinate of the closest eye beacon. So that's some of the work to be done now. And did you want to speak to the, the future or shall I just, just finish that and then you'll do the demo? Okay, so we're going to be experimenting with changing the deployment patterns uh, we're going to additionally be studying the RF spectrum in the building to find out if that has any impact on our results. Uh, we're going to uh, try, with some more funding, mm -hmm. to uh, put some Bluetooth iBeacons into other buildings on the campus and hopefully to, uh, to be able to do an alpha test of a system for the campus based on, we're also working on a WebRTC-based PSAP which should be able to collect all this information and then we'll do a local alpha test on that shortly. Uh, so uh, we will talk about our pilot platform, the platform that we're using to provide indoor location. That'll be tomorrow. And uh, we're uh, experimenting, as I said, with more algorithms that will actually provide the XY coordinates of the caller. Okay. So I think now uh, the team is going to, yes. Thanks, Theron. I just wanted to ask you about the latency behind it. Um, I don't think I heard how soon were you getting into the case to come back. We're well under the 10 seconds. 10 we're seconds. well under the 10 seconds. Yeah, I, I don't know. What, did you have a number? Yeah, it's about eight seconds. Eight yeah. seconds. That's yeah. awesome. And secondly, was there a difference with the latency between using, you said, on the UE, the app, or actually calling the, the test number? Well, I'm counting since you pressed for example, for the app, would be pressing call 911 button and also dialing. I mean, I don't count the time of writing the number. But so from the from the initial from the initial <coughs> call, though, there was no diff no no, no, no difference. Okay. Because the process of the app running in the background is will do the same process no matter what you do. If you call, I will run the the app too. And lastly, what was the distance between the two closest beacons and the Okay. Building? I would say it's... Talk well, into the mic. Talk into the mic. <laughs> we have been doing our organic distribution, so sometimes it can be pretty... They can be like 20 meters away, but sometimes we have some of them that are about 8 meters, 10 meters, one from each other. Now, this is got, this is great work, guys. I mean, I was just telling my partner here that the rule states, you know, either give X Y location or give air direct. So the calls coming from you guys have done even better than that with using beacons to actually get a, a few, you know, yeah. accuracy points away. 
one of the things that we're going to do next that I didn't mention is we're uh, in the real world most buildings already have a Wi-Fi infrastructure and we did our first uh, our first vet or rev of this of this uh, application or this service we did it based on the uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points within all the buildings on the campus so uh, we uh, we applied Unfortunately, the specific uh, access points that were chosen by the school were ones that didn't provide their unique MAC addresses within their uh, Wi-Fi uh, messaging. So we had to do a, 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 a one-off solution, but we did. And even in that, where we had to parse the logs of the, uh, of the access point controller, even with that, we were under the 10 seconds. And uh, so that I can, we can talk about that, that more offline, but, but we did that and our next, one of our next projects will be to integrate Bluetooth with Wi-Fi because the idea would be most buildings already have Wi-Fi, many of them will not have Bluetooth, so we'll try to find an optimal distribution of the combined access points and uh, Bluetooth devices. So we have plenty of, of more data captures to do to, 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 to home in on an optimal distribution, yeah. Sure, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so you partially answered my first question, which is why why you're not integrating Wi-Fi, so you just answered that question. But the second question was, is the Bluetooth passive or is it creating chatter all the time and are you creating interference for other Bluetooth devices? So they're Bluetooth low energy, they're in advertise mode, they are every half a second saying, my name is, my name is, my name is, and that's basically all they're doing. Uh, we have experimented to find out if, uh, you know, if their presence or absence seems to affect our testing. So when we pulled out 50% of them, we wanted to see, you know, if there was a difference in, in the response rates, and we haven't actually seen that uh, the chatter is, is affecting us in any way. Interesting question, and we haven't, I mean, we haven't, you know, we, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we have various things that will tell us who's the Bluetooth in our area, and we can certainly, you know, investigate if that's doing any harm. We haven't observed any harm. We have a, you know, we've only deployed 60 out of our 100, so we have uh, 40 of them sitting, uh, sitting in the lab, and they're not interfering with anybody. And they're sitting there also saying, my name is, you know, they're basically acting like a set of lighthouses. You know, they're just putting out this low energy, which actually we found has a very good range. We're able to go most of the length of one of the corridors, and, and we still see them at a very, like, minus 90 dBm, but, but they're coming through. Yeah. Are, you, are you guys ready with the demo? Okay. All right. Well, now we will. We are going to do a real-time demo. It's a little bit risky, but <laughs> hopefully <laughs> it will work. <laughs> because we want to show also the the piece of. Uh, operator and everything. That's why we are changing the laptops because we already configured for having the two screens, the the smartphone and the and the call taker. <coughs> yeah. Well, here we have an example of one of the devices that we would have in the building. Yeah. It's already open and you can see the different components. Yeah, <laughs> the battery can last for up to one year. Yeah. 
actually what we have found, and somebody will talk about this in, when it's in the IPT con, I think, track. What we found is the administration and the support for the iBeacons has actually taken more of our coding time than the development of, the right of the actual system. So what are because we doing? once these things are deployed, you know, we have to constantly monitor their batteries, which we found now are, are decreasing very slowly. You'll notice that there is a Wi-Fi chip in each of these devices. That's the most uh, hungry for battery. We have to put it to sleep and only wake it up once a day, and all it does then is calls into headquarters and reports what's the level of the battery. We're not using the Wi-Fi chip for anything else excepting for that. So there's no communications excepting for administrative purposes. And as I said, <laughs> the majority of the coding that we've done so far has been to, to keep these things alive and to be able to administer them. That's the only reason there is a Wi-Fi chip in there is to manage that. We, uh, we are actually developing a different architecture for them so that we will eliminate most of the battery requirement. And that is we decided to do a, a sort of a, a sergeant and, and privates where you'd only have a couple per floor that actually needed to talk back to base and the rest of the Bluetooth would just communicate via Bluetooth with the other Bluetooth and then the sergeant Bluetooth would talk up so we'd only, yes, and that we wouldn't even need battery for because we could plug that in someplace. This is a classic ground hum, I think, and uh, it's a connector. Okay, now we will show the screen of the caller that's having an emergency. Uh, we will use the, the app, the official app. I could call 911 directly. Then I have a... a Okay, so now the user will open the application and once I press na call 911, it, the app is gathering all the identifiers from the different I beacons that are here. These I beacons in the database have a specific... I got the call. Okay. Have a specific location defined and then I send the SIP invite with this location and then we can show this is the, the call taker in its head. Wow, we can show it as soon as it comes up, it's just that it. Yeah, this, this is the call taker at the slow. It's IIT test bed and as we can see, we can see the street where we are located, the, even the floor, and if we click inside, we can see the, the place type, uh, Herman Lounge, so it's possible to reach this level of accuracy. Well, and that's all. So thank you very much for being here. more questions if anybody had because we're just going on break now so you no know people had additional
Thanks very much. So it shows the address as well as the location, Herman's Lounge. I'm afraid it's hard to read it. Yeah. Can you see? Can you see it right here? Yeah. What is it? Room zero. <laughs> Well, this is this is uh, according to the NEMA standard for how to how to present the information, and and our PSAP is NEMA compliant. So, whatever was fed to it was fed to it by our location server, which is what did all of the formatting. So we send raw data to the location server; it did all the formatting, sent us back the the uh, XML encoded the way NEMA wants it encoded. And all our and our SIP engine and our SIP application just just put that together into a MIME body and sent it to uh, sent it to the PSAP. Carol, did it come in as a held in the SIP invite? Was there a held URL and create it, or is it directly in there? No, it was simply put into the MIME body. Into the MIME body, we had you know after the RTP, then yeah. then it, it's a, just another border and in XML. In the XML. Yeah. Yeah, and it's according, it's the PIDO file. So it's all, you know, formatted according to IETF and NINA. Yeah. 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 And what we tried to do is the phone doesn't have to do very much work. We wanted the location server to do all of that work. So, and that location server, uh, I think, is, is going to, we were originally designing towards the, the NEAD or the idea of the National Emergency Address Database. We called it the CAD when we started because it was the Campus Emergency Address Database. But the, but the idea was to try to mimic that and the idea also was that in the real world that, that emergency address database would not be on our school's network. It would probably be somewhere on the carrier's network or, or in, in, uh, in, a net, in a network somewhere. And that, of course, is one of the things that's up for discussion and, and development, I think, in the entire community. Nobody really knows the hierarchy. We heard about the hierarchy this morning, about the EZNETS hierarchy. Well, there's going to have to be a hierarchy of these databases and who's going to be responsible for them. So we're working on the campus because we have some control over that. But I think that's a whole other area for both, you know, design, development, and and de development of standards and and really methods. So, yeah. Actually, we do. We do this because we don't want the device to have any kind of intelligence. Like, for example, for security reasons, if you have to protect each device, yeah. and it would be uh, a problem. And also, um, it's more work for the device too. So what we do only is this, the cell phone can't do anything either. It's the location server, the one that will actually interpret this data. So what I do is get ID, for example, 101 from this ID gun, and this ID that I receive, I send it to the location server. And then mm -hmm. it's the location server that says, okay, this ID is in my database. Uh, it's in this, this is the location of the Herman Lounge. So I send this location to the, the phone, and then the phone executes the SID call. Yeah. yeah. I so, so I get both the beacon number and the receipt exactly. of a whole list exactly. of, of beacons that it can and number of packages. So I, I will get at least maybe from one device twenty packages from one only one. So in our for algorithm we use the power that we receive, we use the amount of packages that we receive and the ID. Yes? Um, 
we can say that we have an accuracy below uh, 70 meters, 100 percent of the time. And if we talk about 80 percent of the time, we will have, I think, one below 13 meters. It's in the slides. I think it's about that. Sometimes you can get very accurate uh, estimation, like maybe one meter or two meters, like some other times. But it's important to notice that something that is uh, important for the call dispatcher is the floor, and we are pretty accurate with that. We, uh, we are getting very small amount of, of uh, wrong estimations of the floor. So. Yeah, just one comment on the location. It shows um, USIL Chicago. Well, Herman Lounge is obviously at uh, 3241 South Federal, but in our ECRF, our private ECRF, the county is shown as Chicago instead of Cook. So just a clarification, if we put Cook in our ECRF, it would show up as Cook, but right now it shows up as USIL Chicago Herman Lounge 3241 South Federal.